Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Catarina Dutil Novaes. She is Professor and University Research Chair at the Department of Philosophy of the VU Amsterdam. She is also a Professorial Fellow at Arche in St. Andrews. Her main fields of research are history and philosophy of logic, philosophy of mathematics and social epistemology. Dr. Novais also has general interests in medieval philosophy, philosophy of psychology and cognitive science, general philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, issues pertaining to gender and race, and empirically informed approaches to philosophy in general. And today we're going to talk a little bit about argumentation, reasoning, and fake news. So, Katerina, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much. Yes, I think to my list of interests, I guess you could also add argumentation theory, which is exactly what we'll be talking about today. So, uh, but I should put this on my website, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, interestingly enough, that's what we're going to talk about today, but I missed that one in the introduction. <laughs> anyway. There'll be plenty of time to to fix that, right, by talking about it today. So Yeah, sure. So let's start with that. Uh, what is argumentation then? Well, argumentation is, uh, so uh, what is an argument? I guess it's easier if we start with, uh, with the idea of what, what an argument is. An argument is usually conceived as, well, there are many ways of understanding what an argument is. You can have all kinds of pedantic philosophical discussions on the ontological status of arguments, but I guess generally you could say an argument is a linguistic structure where you have premises and a conclusion, and the premises are supposed to lend support to the conclusion, make the conclusion more likely to be the case. That's so understood in kind of this uh, freestanding way. An argument is, is this linguistic entity, and then there's this connection between premises and conclusion. Uh, but that's, of course, at a very uh, uh, abstract level. And then uh, you ask me, what, what is argumentation? Then you would say that argumentations are practices, are discursive practices, where these kinds of linguistic entities, arguments, play a prominent role. But that's, of course, still very approximative, and there will be all kinds of ways in which you, you know, uh, does this count as an argument? Does this count as argumentation or not? There will be all kinds of... Uh, uh, borderline cases. And also I mentioned that arguments are linguistic entities, but I guess you could also have, you can have visual arguments, right? And you can also have sometimes arguments with only a conclusion and no premises. So there are all kinds of variations around this theme, but I guess you could say the paradigmatic cases are these linguistic entities with, our, with premises and conclusion. Mm -hmm. And what is it for exactly? Many things, I think, right? This is one of the big questions uh, in argumentation theory and, uh, you know, in, in, in different people are interested in arguments. Uh, first of all, I mean, I know you also do a lot of, uh, you're very interested also in, in, in uh, developmental, sorry, no, in evolutionary psychology. So this question of functions, of course, always arises very much from evolutionary perspectives. But I would even say, I would take a step back and I'll first say, the, quite, the real question to be asked is, does argument even have a function? Right? And I'm here, I'm thinking of the philosopher, philosopher of biology, Lisa Lloyd, who made this point in an article of hers, I forgot the name, The Logic of Research Questions, I think it's the name of the article, where she makes this point that for biological traits, right, in, in, in organisms, the right question to ask is not, uh, what is the function of this trait, but rather, does this trait have a function, right? So I do think that uh, arguments have functions, by the way, but I'm just saying, like, I, I would take a step back because it's possible that it, there is no obvious function, right? It, it's possible that it's not a, a question that's going to help us understand the phenomena. And in fact, there is a, 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 an argumentation theorist, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Goodwin, who uh, argued, has a paper against functionalist approaches to argumentation. Right? So all this to say, right, this is the typical thing that philosophers do. You ask a question and I say, well, actually, <laughs> this, the question itself is complicated. But this being said, I do think that, uh, and I, I'm not against functionalist approaches. A lot of my research ap approaches uh, um, different topics, the philosophical topics from a functionalist perspective, right? That, to try to understand, you know, given 
human practices what what you know what what do they do what's the goal what's the aim uh, so I do I, I do think that the functionalist question about arguments is a legitimate question and I will, in my work what I've been doing so far is I've been distinguishing three main functions of arguments that you could see that you could, you know you could associate with practices of argumentation but of course this is just kind of like the, this taxonomy right that I'm proposing I'm not saying like in the essence that's how it is but just to kind of organize the different phenomena I would I have proposed this uh, taxonomy with three categories the first is argumentation aimed at uh, say epistemic goals right of improving our uh, epistemic situation so just you know understanding things better acquiring knowledge right so that would be let's call the uh, purely epistemic application of argumentation then the second goal uh, the second uh, function of arguments would be uh, to reach consensus so this is there's also a very strong uh, tradition within argumentation theory that the purpose of ours that says that the purpose of argumentation is to you know you start kind of you know, having different opinions and then you discuss and then you kind of come closer together and you can think about, for example, the pragma dialectic tradition in argumentation theory, but also Habermas, in a sense, is also a philosopher of consensus in this sense. And so that's the idea of like reaching consensus through argumentation. And this, of course, is important if you take a kind of broader perspective. It's what's why do we need consensus? Well, because we need to coordinate. Right? It's for social coordination. As, as uh, hyper-social animals that we are, we need to team up often, and, uh, and then we just need to kind of uh, find ways to you know, agree on what it is that we're going to do together. And finally, the third uh, category, which is it related to the second one, but then uh, is more general, is the idea that argumentation is meant for conflict management. So, uh, so whenever, right there, precisely when there's disagreement, there's conflict. Uh, one, one of the things that people can do to manage it is to try to argue with each other, right? To exchange reasons with each other. And this would be kind of, the, kind of an in-between reaction to fight or flight, right? So you could, so if there's a disagreement, you could just, you know, physically, you know, fight it out with, with whoever you're disagreeing with. Or you could just say, you know what, I'm just moving out, just going away, right? So you, the, fl the flight response. And argumentation would be something in between, right? You don't beat them up, but you also don't just leave the situation. Maybe you cannot leave. Maybe you really, you know, you're bound to that particular situation and you can't move away. So in that sense, there's a sense in which that's the, what the philosopher Scott Aiken says. There's a sense in which argumentation is a pacifist response to conflict in the sense that it's better than just, you know, physically fighting, right? So I would say that, you know, I was in my Stanford Encyclopedia entry on argument and argumentation, I use these three categories to try to kind of organize, because obviously uh, argumentation is an extremely multifaceted category, right? To the, even to the point that you might ask yourself, is it even one like natural category? Does it even make sense to talk about argumentation as like one kind of more or less unified thing? I think it makes sense if you think about this uh, idea that I, uh, that I presented at the beginning, right? That the arguments are uh, 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 where you, when you give reasons, for that support a certain claim, right? So the giving and asking for reasons, as Robert Brandom uh, puts it. So in that sense, I do think that's kind of the overarching uh, uh, common characteristic of all these different phenomena. But functionally, it's quite diverse. There are many different functions in many different situations. And what kinds of contexts does argumentation apply to? Yeah, so that is that's also a discussion. That's like a you know a disagreement between you know uh, people. Like I actually I'm one of those that I think that argument and argumentation is fairly odd. It's a fairly kind of it's not a you know it's not a thing that people do in the pub, right, or out in the street. So it's a it's a rather specialized kind of discourse, right? I think that. So I think that. Uh, argumentation is, you know, with a certain level of regimentation is used uh, certainly, of, of course, in the sciences, right, in, in, in academia, in intellectual pursuits. 
uh, also in, uh, in legal juridical contexts, right, in a court of law or you know, in other kinds of juridical contexts, and also in uh, politics, at least, you know, in deliberative democracies. So I think that these three kind of areas will be the main areas where the main domains of human life, let's call it, where argumentation takes a, a prominent position. Uh, so, and then uh, you could also so talk about education, but I think education kind of pertains to sciences, broadly speaking. Uh, so there's this disagreement, uh, you know, whether you need to, an argumentation is some sort of cultural oddity that only arises in certain societies, or is it present everywhere? So that's, uh, that's to some extent an empirical question, but it's not just empirical because it will depend on how you conceptualize argumentation in the first place. If you have a very uh, broad, inclusive conception of argumentation, then of course you'll see it in many more places, as it were, right? Because more phenomena will count as instances of argumentation. Whereas um, if, you, if you have a narrow understanding where you really need to do something more like more regimented with premises and conclusion and some sort of marker of the connection between premises and conclusion, then you'll say, well, that it's something that's not as widespread, right? But this being said, so I do think that to a great extent, uh, uh, practices of argumentation it's, it are cultural products. But I, of, of course, don't think that this, they only happen in very specific societies, such, such as, say, our, you know, Western European societies or North American societies. There's the super interesting and uh, very kind of foundational work of Edwin Hutchins, right, on the uh, ways in which Trobian, uh, the, the, the Trobian Islanders, they discuss, they discuss with each other. I don't know if you know this book, right? So he was presenting it mostly in terms of reasoning, but actually what's going on in us is argumentation. They have all these very kind of complicated and regimented ways of figuring out like who, who owns a particular piece of land or not. And then you can see, so these are, this is a small scale society and yet clearly they're engaging in what anyone, I guess, coming from argumentation studies, argumentation theory we will call, yeah, this is really argumentation. Right? So I do think it can be quite widespread and, you know, because it's kind of a, quite a, 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 a natural, I would almost say it's a cultural attractor, right? I know you interviewed Dan Sperber many, I think it was some years ago, I think, right? Uh, it was in late 2021. Exactly. Yeah, so not so long ago. So I do think that it's like, it arises independently uh, in many situations because it's a quite, quite a natural response to sociality problems that arise for humans. But I don't want to say that it's a human universal. Right? So necessarily, I, I compare this, I, you know, perhaps a useful analogy is uh, counting practices, right? to count with numbers, with natural numbers. It's extremely widespread, but as I'm sure you know, and probably your, your, your viewers also, uh, in uh, the recent decades, uh, there have been these, these uh, uh, cultures that were studied that mostly in the, in the Brazilian Amazonian jungle, uh, that don't have practices of counting that are, you know, thoroughly developed. So, and I, you know, the uh, the Pirahas and the Mundukurus, and the point uh, is you're that talking about the work of Daniel Everett, right? Who studied yes, the exactly. Piraha. Yeah. But not just, also Pierre Picard, right? So there's mm -hmm. this French French school, right? Together with Stanislaw Dahena, they studied these these uh, these cultures that don't engage in substantive counting practices, right? Mm -hmm. And there are, so what I think there is, well, you see, well, you know, if in their kind of, you know, way of being in the world, their way of being in their environment, the need for counting hasn't really presented itself. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't, right? There's nothing cognitively different between them and us, but the way they, the, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, cultural exposure that they've had and the sociality exposure that they had, well, that just didn't really give rise to the need for counting practices, well, then it doesn't develop. And I think that argumentation is a, is a kind of a similar phenomenon, right? It's like, on the one hand, a very natural response and it kind of probably latches on uh, cognitive uh, possibilities that we have from the start as humans. But I do, I do think it needs to kind of develop culturally and it also needs to be taught right so i think both kind of the 
that's called, say, the phylogeny of argumentation. It was how it arises in a given culture, but also the ontogeny for the particular individuals. These are things that need to be, uh, so practices that need to be learned, right, by, by, by exposure, by, you know. So that's why, you know, I, I think that on the one hand, argumentation is quite widespread, uh, but I think it also, it's not as widespread as some some have claimed it is, right? So the people, especially Mercier and and Sperber, who uh, view argumentation as a, as a as a genetic adaptation, I don't think it is, but I think that it's uh, so it's quite widespread and and certainly in large scale societies uh, that it becomes a very natural. Uh, approach to to all kinds of sociality challenges that arise. Okay, so we will come back to Mercier's and Sperber's theory of reasoning in a bit, but uh, what constitutes an argument then? So someone makes a statement, how can we tell that it's an argument or not? You mean what makes, what, what makes an argument valid? Uh, or or it, even it, before that? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. So, so <clears throat> the the idea is that a linguistic intervention counts as an argument if first certain statements are made, right? The premises, and then there is the claim, and then the conclusion is stated, and there is a claim of some sort of connection of support between these premises and the premises and the conclusion, right? So there's this idea. So there's like also this kind of higher order judgment being made. So it's not just I'm saying A, B, C, right? Which would be just kind of three statements. No, I'm saying A, B, therefore C. And that means I'm making a kind of higher order statement that there is a connection of support between the statements A and B and conclusion C. And so that, that's kind of what I would think is a... Is a Kind of schematic characterization, what, what counts as a, a purported argument, right? An argument, a, a linguistic intervention that intends to be an argument. And then, of course, the next question is, when is it successful, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, and what is adversariality in argumentation and what is it for? Well, I mean, so I, as I was saying in the beginning, you, um, one of the... What I, what I see as one of the functions of argumentation is to manage conflict, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a truism to observe that, you know, humans, you know, we're hypersocial animals, but we're also kind of always, you know, entering all kinds of conflictual situations with each other, right? So we're not like ants and bees where, you know, everybody just knows what they're supposed to do and there's just no, no discussion and you just follow the script as it were. No, for humans, on the one hand, we depend very much from, from each other. We depend on each other, but we also want to protect our own individual interests. And then from that, of course, all kinds of clashes emerge, right? So people mm -hmm. are, uh, both groups want to protect their interests, individuals want to protect their interests. So there's this thing about interests that's obviously very salient in a, right, in a, in a, in, for, for humans, for the way humans socialize. Which again is not uh, is not the same, doesn't have the same uh, import for other animals, the eusocial animals like bees and ants and all that. So given that we have conflict, right? So there are conflictual situations arise. So what do you do? Well, you can, like I said at the beginning, you can either you know fight physically. Or you can run away, right? So I'm not saying this, these are you know exclusive. It's not an exclusive taxonomy either. But uh, so then one w one way in which you could uh, right uh, manage conflict and conflict of interests in particular would be argumentation. But if that's the case, argumentation not always but often will arise in situations where there is already a certain degree of background conflict even before you enter the argumentation situation. That's why, in fact, you then try to settle the conflict somehow by our engaging in the exchange of reasons. And if that's the case, then some of this conflictuous uh, stance will carry over to the argumentative situation, especially when what is at stake is, in some sense or another, having your interests prevail over the interests of the other person. 
right? So then you just adopt this uh, uh, competitive position because you want to win, right? So there's this whole discussion in the argumentation literature uh, about the uh, metaphor, the war metaphor for argumentation. So the argumentation theorist Dan Cohen is, is very famous for this paper that he wrote in the 90s, uh, Argument is War and War is Hell. And I think also Lakoff uh, also talks about, uh, uh, right, so what, what's the name of the, the, movie, the book about metaphors, Lakoff and? Uh, the metaphors we live by. Yes, exactly. So yeah. what's the other author? I forgot. So the, that book starts one of the first examples they use uh, of arguments, of uh, sorry, of metaphors is the metaphor of argument as war. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a, a well-studied uh, um, uh, conception of argumentation. And in that conception, then argumentation becomes like a zero-sum game, mm -hmm. right? So if you and I are arguing with each other, either I'm going to win. Uh, or you're going to win. And if I win, you lose. And if you lose, if you win, I lose. Right? So zero sum. And the thought here is that if you, uh, so, so there's really something at stake that you're fighting for. Right? It's like martial art. I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which you could uh, unpack the metaphor. So that would, that's one conception. And I do think that in some cases, for sure, that applies, right? That in some instances of argumentation do have this kind of zero sum structure. So for example, say in politics, you might say, well, you know, there are two candidates and they're debating with each other. One's gonna win and the other's gonna lose. Right? So then they'll do what they can to convince the voters to vote for them rather than for the, for the opponent. But I think that, um, uh, there is this tendency, and that's what uh, Lakoff and his co-author, who, I'm just having a blank here. Who, uh, who? Yeah, I, I can't remember the name either. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, uh, so they, they, they say, well, if you always think about argumentation as a sort of fight, as war, that really kind of contaminates, as it were, your behavior also in situations where that would not be required. Mm -hmm where it's not obvious that it really is a fight where one is going to win and the other is going to lose. And, and in that case, then you, uh, the metaphor, the, the analogy can induce overly combative behavior in argumentative situations, which would not be appropriate for that particular situation, given that there is not that much background conflict in the first place. So I think one example of that would be, say, in a kind of philosophy seminar, right, where in theory you're there, at least you would think, you're there to learn from each other, to exchange, you know, ideas, and, and yet in uh, many uh, uh, professional contexts in philosophy, less and less now, but traditionally there was this idea, you know, that's what you do, you just beat your opponent when you're arguing with them, you just want to kind of... Uh, you know, you want to see blood on the floor, you know, and then there's uh, like a scorekeeping, the home team and the, uh, the visiting team. And so, and that I think is, 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 and many people have pointed this out. Huh? I mean, there's this whole literature on criticizing this overly uh, combative and adversarial understanding of argumentation. I think in those cases, this adversarial attitude is not appropriate. And instead, you, you, you would have something that's much more cooperative going on, right? In a, in a way, what you're doing here is really trying to, uh, you know, together understand something that there's some sort of joint project, project there. This being said, right, so, there's this whole, also this, uh, this um, tradition that emphasizes the, co the use of argumentation in cooperative contexts. In particular, uh, Michael Tomazello and, and many, many colleagues have worked on this. I'm currently working with a, a developmental psychologist, Bahar Koyman, from the University of Manchester, and she uh, was uh, she used to work with uh, with uh, Thomas Zeller, and they have this whole take on how argumentation is particularly uh, suitable for cooperative situations where there is a common goal that you want to reach, and then you exchange reasons with each other on how best to achieve this goal. And in those cases, of course, becoming over, very a competitive adversarial is actually not going to be uh, conducive to achieving this goal together, right? Mm -hmm. But this being said, I also think that kind of completely giving up on the idea that at least in some cases, argumentation is going to have this adversarial component. I also think that that's a mistake because there are situations where there really is a lot of uh, 
conflict in the background and then it's not and then to ask of those people who are engaged there to be nice and you know and use the right civil tone that also is inappropriate right and you see this in a lot of political contexts right when there's a lot of people called tone policing oh you need to be civil and stuff right so i mean in, in sort of like for example if you think about very extreme situations say in the united states there are a lot of efforts of voter suppression Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, especially the Republican Party trying to get people not to vote because then they know they would vote for the other party. And then, of course, when you're talking about this, you're angry and rightly so, right? Because they're literally like doing something that's in blanted conflict with your interests and your democratic rights even. There, I mean, then yes, then you should just like, you know, say it as it is and be adversarial about it and say, look, this is just, you know, this is wrong because of this and this and that, which of course doesn't mean that's necessarily going to be effective, mm -hmm. right? But at least in this, in the sense of actually you achieving your goal, but at least it, it, you know, then it to ask of people in situations where there is a lot of background conflict to then engage in the kind of argumentation that you would expect in a situation of cooperation, that is also not appropriate. Right. Uh, does trust also play a role in argumentation? Yes, yeah, so that's a uh, work that I've been doing for a few years now that uh, to emphasize the role of trust. And, and so, so let me kind of give a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there's this very famous paper by Sperber and colleagues, uh, Epistemic Vigilance of 2010, I think. Right. And then after that, also Hugo Mercier has written uh, on this, and you know others, when they say, well, you know, in situations, usually, I mean, why you're we're doing we're engaging in epistemic vigilance, right? Because we're always getting information from other people, but they can they can misinform us either because they themselves are not knowledgeable, or because they're doing this on purpose to mm -hmm. mislead us, right? To to then uh, protect their own interests. So we need these mechanisms to filter right, information that comes to us from other people. Right, so what, what do you do? Well, one of the things you do is precisely to kind of evaluate the trustworthiness of the informant, right? So does this person, uh, is, is this person knowledgeable? And second, does this person, uh, is this person trying to uh, screw me over, right, to put it plainly? Is this person trying to protect their interests over mine? So that's one thing that then you're looking at the source of the argument, really, of the person or the, who's uh, putting it forward or the source of information. And then they say, well, in cases where you don't really trust this person enough to take their word at face value, right, where, which would be a case of pure testimony, mm -hmm. right, which is also something that social epistemologists have discussed a lot. In cases where you don't have enough trust to deadly, they just tell you, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow, and you just believe them and say, sure, fine. I, like you, 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 for example, you think, well, this person has, you know, misled you before or whatever, and they tell you, is this going to rain tomorrow? And then you can say, how do you know? Like, what are your reasons, right, for, mm -hmm. for, for thinking, for saying that it's going to rain tomorrow? I so tell you, you want to check the, the, the reasons they have for saying this. So when you do this, you're entering the domain of argumentation. You're leaving the domain of testimony. You're entering the domain of argumentation. And what they say, Sperber, Mercy, and others, is that they say that it's a very plausible that when you don't trust the person enough to just take their word at face value, you ask for additional reasons. And so they say, and that's also something in a way that uh, it sounds very Robert brandon -y as well, right? So Robert Brandom who talks about the game of giving and asking for reasons. But uh, so they say, well, you, this is, so that's why argumentation is a solution to the bottleneck of information in the case of cases of diminished trust. Uh, because they think what you what you cannot uh, take at face value just uh, right from the from the the informer, you can then inspect yourself and become convinced yourself of the accuracy of that piece of information if they provide reasons. Because then you just inspect the argument, the reasons. Mm -hmm. So they think that um, that there is this that that it's a response, it's a possibility to solve the problem of let's say solve the problem as it were of diminished trust and the transmission of information. What I've been saying in my work is that it, this doesn't really work like that because um, to even uh, uh, spend time examining an argument 
spend cognitive resources thinking about an argument. You have to have some reason to think that that this person is not trying to mislead you or that this person is, is, is to some extent knowledgeable because otherwise it's a waste of your time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so in that sense, that's, uh, argumentation then is much closer to testimony than you would otherwise think in the sense that you also require a certain amount of trust in the person who's putting forward the argument to you to even think, well, this is worth engaging with. This is worth paying attention to. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and the problem for like what, what's really, what makes it very difficult for us is that uh, in most topics that matter, we, uh, we are not in a position to evaluate whether the argument is correct or not. We just lack the knowledge, right? So, so in very simple things like, you know, like the example I guess it's gonna rain tomorrow. And then you say, well, how do you know? Like, what makes you say that? Well, you know, I saw it on the, you know, I saw it on the, on the weather broadcast. Sure, right, that's fairly simple. But for example, in a, things like, should I take a vaccine, right, for COVID? Should I take a, like the, even like if you would do, should I take the fourth dose, right, the second booster or not? The arguments for this are complicated, right, for or against. They're scientific arguments based on, you know, uh, complicated scientific reasoning. And most of us are not in a position to, uh, to uh, appreciate or to evaluate the correctness of these arguments, mm -hmm. right? So we just need to defer to experts, right? right. In the sense that, and then, then of course, then the question becomes like, who do you, who do you take to be an expert on this? And that's obviously a huge can of worms as well. But just to say that uh, we, precisely because in most matters of significance, we just don't have the right, the, the kind of uh, knowledge required to really be able to assess the correctness of an argument, we need to trust, again, rather than inspect the reasons ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is argumentation essentially an individual or a social phenomenon? Of course, at first sight, because it's something that's done between different people, uh, you would say, obviously, I guess, that it's a social phenomenon. But since in the social sciences, for, I think, all kinds of phenomena out there, there are people who try to understand them on an individual level and other people yeah. try to understand them on a social group collective level, uh, there's still that question. Yes, right? there is. Let me just add something just on the point that I was discussing before, oh, because then I yes, remember, which is that I mentioned Sperber and Mercier as somebody, as, as people who disagree with me, but it's actually mm -hmm. not entirely correct because both very much recognize the role of trust also for argumentation. Uh, so uh, Des Perber has been giving talks on this, and uh, I've also talked to Hugo about this. So it's not, I'm painting it a bit very much like, you know, kind of a black or white thing. We still have some disagreements, and maybe we'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. We still have some disagreements on the kind of the order of these, these, these you know, how the, the phenomena unfold. But they also recognize the importance of trust for argumentation, just to be clear, right? So it's just that they have a different take on how it, the, the mechanisms involved than me. Mm -hmm. Right, so to your question on whether it's social or individual. So let me put my cards on the table. I'm a Vygotskian, okay? I think everything is social, <laughs> almost everything <laughs> is. So it's like a cognition, human cognition is almost entirely shaped by social interactions, okay? So that's my own, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's where I'm, that's my, my, my starting point. And, and I think that, uh, uh, so for everything, right? So I was talking about counting just before, uh, how do you learn to count? It's a social practice. Uh, how do you, you know, like all kinds of, uh, even like so-called higher cognitive functions, they all come from the social experiences. That's the, the Vygotskian story. And I think that the same holds for argumentation. I already mentioned this a little bit, that argumentation, uh, to be learned, it needs to be kind of taught, as it were, right? People need to, children need to be exposed to these kinds of linguistic practices and see how it works and engage in the practices themselves and then try a little bit and people say, hey, no, you can't, right? So for example, kids, like you say, a kid says, I want this, I want this. And then you say, yeah, but 
no, you can't have it. Yes, I can have it because I want it. And you're like, no, this is not a good argument. It doesn't work like this. So this is how you actually teach. This is kind of a Wittgensteinian idea, right? That the uh, argumentation is a kind of language game, right? Which needs to be learned by means of these kinds of, uh, um, you know, exposure and, and, and training. So from that point of view, I'd say it's all social and it's also social in the sense that it's meant for the application for, for social coordination by and large, right? For the solu resolu resolution of social uh, uh, challenges that arise, right? So, for example, if we humans were uh, the kinds of species that lead solitary lives, right? You know, you have these species that never meet other, you know, members of the species except for mating. Then, obviously, you know, we wouldn't engage in argumentation. Right, because not to, whereas like it's really precisely because we are uh, very social animals that we need to engage in argumentation. So in that sense, also it's very much of a social phenomenon for me. This being said, of course, there is the interesting question of how, like our uh, genetic endowment, as it were, right? So how it kind of makes it possible for us to develop the necessary skills to engage in argumentation. So it's not to say that you can only study, argument, study argumentation from a social perspective. No, it's also interesting to look at that, kind of like how individuals acquire these skills, right? But these skills, they are shaped, they're both shaped by sociality and they're shaped for sociality. So in that sense, I'm very kind of, I have a very kind of extreme social account of argumentation, I guess. Uh, do you have a, like a, an individual approach to argumentation and mind, do you think that would kind of contrast with that? Just yeah. kind of to have a sense of uh, if what else you would have in mind. Uh, I mean, applied to argumentation, uh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, again, we're talking again about Mercier's Berber, right? When they, they say that uh, it's an individual capacity, right? So they don't, they, they think it's, a, it's an adaptation and mm -hmm. they think it's an individual adaptation. So they have this idea that it's for my personal benefit that mm -hmm. to become a good arguer. So there's a sense in which they have this, also this kind of individual perspective as mm -hmm. well, even though of course they're very much, they emphasize the interactive account of reasoning, but, but they still have, I guess, more of a, they, they, they emphasize the individual benefits of, of, being a good arguer, whereas for me, that's less prominent in my account. Uh, yes, but I, I mean, still, uh, of course, this is just my opinion, but I, I'm not sure if I would classify Mercius and Sperber's account of uh, reasoning as uh, an individual, uh, as looking no. at it through an individual perspective, because Absolutely. there's still that interactive element. Absolutely. There. So it's not, yeah. in fact, they argue against the overly individualistic accounts of reasoning. Yeah. What I'm saying is that I'm even more on the, you know, sure. to the social side of the spectrum than they are. And I think also uh, I like the review on their book by the cognitive scientist Celia Hayes, right? She, she mm -hmm. made a similar point there. So, so, so there's still this kind of, also still a, an individual focus there, which they're very open about, and that's cool. And I think, of course, that you can see why they would have this focus because they, since they do kind of work within a framework of, say, evolutionary psychology, and then evolutionary psychology typically doesn't really adopt kind of group level selection, right? It's more mm -hmm. like on the individual level selection. So, that, of course, there has to be a story on the individual benefits of becoming a good arguer in their, in their account. Whereas because I'm not tied to this evolutionary psychology perspective, mm -hmm. that for me, that's not something that becomes salient in my account of argumentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, perhaps if it were other people like uh, David Sloan Wilson, Joe Henrik, Jonathan Haidt and others, perhaps they would, in this particular case, of course, they don't do work on argumentation specifically or reasoning, but they would probably be open to a more a group selectionist perspective. But yeah, Mercy and Sperber, I think, are more on the individual side of things when it comes to evolution. Yes. Exactly. The selection, the level of select where uh, natural selection occurs. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is the social epistemology of argumentation? I mean, uh, what aspects of social epistemology apply to an understanding of argumentation? Yeah, so, um, so that's the name, by the way, of this research project that I've been leading for now four and a bit, four and a half years almost, right? the Social Epistemology of Argumentation, funded by the European Research Council, which I graciously, graciously acknowledge, right? So thank you, the ERC, for giving me the money to work on this. <laughs> uh, so the, the, okay, let me just say what, what, like why I thought that this was an interesting thing to study, the social epistemology of argumentation. First, because as I said at the beginning, one of the applications of argumentation seems to be very much epistemic, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this, you know, John Stuart Mill, right? And others, and even if you go back to, in a sense, Plato and Aristotle, there's this idea that through argumentation, you can actually come closer to the truth on a given subject matter. And so there's definitely this kind of this epistemic component to argumentation. At least, I mean, they, this can be discussed, right? But uh, at least there's many people have viewed, have attributed this strong uh, epistemic component to argumentation. So that's one thing. The other thing that I noted is that uh, uh, argumentation hadn't really been treated that much by social epistemologists. So Alvin Goldman, who's of course a pioneer in analytic social epistemology, he, he has written on the social epistemology of argumentation, but this hasn't really been, been picked up on much. Right? So there hasn't been that much of a development there, whereas everybody was talking very much about testimony. Mm -hmm. And there, was, there wasn't that much discussion on argumentation. And I thought, well, you know, this, this is really, argumentation is one of the ways in which people exchange epistemic resources with each other. Right. So that seems like a, an interesting thing, important thing to study. So, and the, which would be presumably, at least to, in some respects, different from other ways in which people exchange information, such as testimony. So we needed to, to look into that, right? So how argumentation uh, plays a role in these general processes of, exchanging information, exchanging knowledge, and exchanging epistemic resources, and also perhaps even producing new epistemic resources together. So mm -hmm. this was the general question. And then what you can do there, you use like, you know, a lot of the conceptual tools from social epistemology to, to think about, uh, you know, argumentation specifically. Of course, we've already talked a lot about trust, which is one of the key uh, 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 questions in social epistemology, questions pertaining to expertise arise, questions pertaining to epistemic autonomy arise. Right? So one thing that you could say is good about arguments is that, well, they, they give you more epistemic autonomy because you kind of come to the conclusion yourself, right? Some, somebody gives you the reasons and then you come to the conclusion yourself. And so it's kind of a more autonomous thing than presumably testimony where I just take your word at face value. Right? So all these different uh, questions that uh, conceptual tools that are already available in the toolkit of the social epistemology, I thought, epistemologist, I thought it would be interesting to apply them to argumentation. And that's, you know, what I've been doing in the past uh, well, four and a half years or more right, since I was writing the project already before. Right. So I guess this is the question everyone has been waiting for. <laughs> Does argumentation change minds? Exactly, right? Because that's uh, one way in which you would think if argumentation really works to exchange epistemic resources, there has to be some sort of uptake, right? If you give right. somebody an argument, what's the effect of that? Right? Because if it has no effect at all, mm -hmm. then maybe it doesn't even count as a prominent way in which people exchange epistemic resources with each other. So, um, and, and so the question, right, so this general, do arguments change minds? So on the one hand, you have this kind of, kind of let's call it optimistic take, uh, epitomized by John Stuart Mill, that arguments really do change minds, right? They kind of really help you get closer to the truth and they improve your understanding, right? So that's why it's, John Stuart Mill says, it's very important to engage with the centers, by the way, the dissenter, that's you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, right, so Mill really emphasizes uh, the, the value of dissent in this sense, because he, they, he really thinks there's epistemic value in that. Uh, on the other hand, you have the kind of also empirical observation that many, many times, 
people when they exchange arguments in the end they polarize right they disagree even more with each other or right so there are all kinds of uh, phenomena that seem to indicate that arguments don't really change minds, that they're rather futile, right? So either you already, like if you already thought something at the beginning, then, you know, arguments will only reinforce that belief that you have and it make it perhaps even more extreme, but it will, you will not be swayed by arguments. So that's, there's the school of thought that thinks also that arguments are very futile in this way. And what I was wondering right, with this project was one of the main motivations to start the project is, uh, so maybe there's like a, a, an answer in between, right? So then the question becomes, under which conditions uh, is the, ex the exchange of reasons conducive to first people like improving epistemically and changing people's minds? And that's what I've been studying in this project and what I've come, you know, at this point, my conclusion is that it can happen, but on, only under uh, specific circumstances. And, uh, and uh, so I have some examples. Uh, one example, for example, is the so kind of societal example. Here in the Netherlands, there's this folk figure, Black Pete, who's supposed to be the, the helper of St. Nicholas. Right? So there's like this big children's uh, celebration in the beginning of uh, December. Mm -hmm. And uh, traditionally, this figure, Black Pete, is portrayed in a very racist way, you know, black face, thick lips, curly hair. And, and uh, for many, you know, for many years, like I've been living here since 99, for many years, most people just thought there was nothing problematic about it. It was just like completely fun. It was fun. And of course, from early on, there were people, especially uh, people of color, but not only, who are saying already, hey, no, this is not okay. This is, this really is very, very kind of puts us in a very difficult position, right? It really reinforces a lot of prejudice against us and stuff. And for the many, for many, many years, like nobody was talking about it. I mean, the, people were talking about it, but there wasn't a societal debate going on, right? And then uh, some 10 years ago, a bit more, activists started to kind of more aggressively promote the the, 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 the the discussion, right? So some people showed up at the parades with t-shirts that said Black Peter's racism and there was a lot of uproar. These people were initially even arrested and there was, but the interesting thing is that there has been over the years a very noticeable shift in public opinion. So about 5% per year of people who then changed their minds from thinking that it was a perfectly fine tradition to coming to think that actually it was a problematic tradition. Mm -hmm. right? And this happened uh, over the years and it's come to a point now that actually the black face, black feet, basically doesn't exist anymore. Oh, it still exists right in pockets of uh, like people who are you know, traditionalists, but by and large, people now, they, they just put suit on the face and they say, well, it's because Black Pete has to go through the chimney and that's why they get suit on the face. But uh, the, and I see this whole thing as really having, at least to some extent, arguments really have played a role, mm -hmm. right? Arguments and showing, you know, or telling people, look, this is problematic because of this and this and this. Look, you know, children of color around that time of, uh, of, uh, of the celebrations, they didn't even want to go to school because other children were making fun of them and calling them black peat and all this. And people started to really come to realize, you know, how damaging that was for certain portions of the population. And, and they just didn't know before in a way. So it's really been in a way, uh, uh, there's a, it's not, because some people say, well, wasn't it just a change of values, right? That people came to change their values. No, I don't think it people, fundam at least many people didn't fundamentally change their values. They just came to know things that they didn't know before in particular, right, the very kind of negative effects of this tradition for certain children, and obviously more globally than that. So I think that this is an instance where arguments have changed minds at the kind of societal level, but it takes a long, long time because first of all, there needs to be exposure. Right? People need to even get exposure, and I think their social media, internet has played a role. Secondly, people have to come to trust enough those who say, hey, this is not okay to even listen. Mm -hmm. right? At the beginning, you had a couple of activists who were, who were uh, you know, uh, 
uh, putting forward the, the, the problematic nature of the tradition. And many times these people are just dismissed. Oh, you know, they're radicals. Well, they were themselves people of color. So, oh, you know, they're like just being overly sensitive and stuff. So they were dismissed. But when more and more people started, and many white people started saying, hey, I, now, I realize that this is just not okay. Then more and more uh, people started to listen. And now actually that's actually, a, a, even these original activists are now, uh, seeing who are portrayed at the beginning as radicals, uh, unreasonable radicals, they now have much more uh, recognition that they were really, you know, making a good point at the beginning. But then again, right, exposure and, and enough trust really had to be in place for this to happen. So sorry that I went on perhaps a bit too long here, but I like to discuss at least a concrete example. But this is like, uh, and related to this very much, the abolitionist movement in the, in the 19th century, right? So it was also a similar uh, process, but there I think, uh, at least that's what the historians said, it was much less through rational arguments that there was a change in public opinion with respect to slavery, but more uh, as a result of uh, personal stories, right? Uh, so former slaves telling their stories of, you know, how mistreated they were and all this. This is really, so there I would say it's less by means of arguments that it happens societally and more by means of like these personal narratives. So just to contrast, right, there are different ways in which public opinion can change, not just by means of arguments, but also there are other kinds of discursive devices that can play a role that. And that's like a societal thing that I described. There are also kind of individual cases of people changing minds. And here, of course, I'm talking about very polemical, uh, value-laden debates. In, in scientific debates, of course, it can happen that people change their minds uh, more readily uh, because, right, I guess, you know, they, they, that's the whole game. Uh, that's the, what's, how science is supposed to work, right? That, you know, I have this position and then somebody comes up with a, with a new, uh, say, a new study, a new experiment that really kind of calls into question my original position. Then many times, not always, right? Many times I'm like, well, yeah, in, view, in light of the new evidence, right, for example, with the pandemic, we saw this happening because there was like things were changing all the time. And many, many people, including experts, who first said, well, you know, I think masks don't work, and then later came to change their minds about this. So in science, it can be, uh, it can happen a bit, a bit more easily. But even in science, too, as we know, right, there's this idea, no, I'm sticking to my guns, and, you know, no, there's no, no amount of evidence is going to make me change my mind about the, kind of my deep-seated beliefs. So, for example, Albert Einstein, who absolutely hated quantum physics, quantum mechanics, never, like, you know, never change his mind about this. So that, even in science, that can happen too. Yeah, <clears throat> science is certainly not value free, but that's, no, exactly, uh, yeah. that's a discussion a for, topic, yes, for, yes. That's for another day, I guess. Yes, exactly. So we've been focusing a lot on argumentation. Uh, what is reason? What is reason? Mm -hmm. mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very open, uh, open question. So, uh, yeah, and then I think that uh, Hugo and uh, Dan, right, in their book, uh, Merci Asper, but they really helped with kind of untangling some of the uh, conceptual uh, uh, confusions there. So I think, so I would say uh, reasons, right? So there's this idea of exchanging reasons. That's one mm -hmm. thing we've been talking about. Then there's a lot of discussion. What is exactly a reason? Right? Philosophers spend a lot of time talking about this. I would say... I guess I told you as a first approximation, right? A, a reason is something that supports, right? Increases the likelihood of a given uh, outcome. And though you can have practical reason, right? So I can tell you, like, oh, you know, you should do your shake, you should, you know, no, take the vaccine to be better protected against uh, a certain disease. That's a practical reason. Although there can also be kind of more kind of theoretical reasons where I say, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, some other example of uh, something that supports uh, uh, like a, a conclusion that's not necessarily practical. But so that's reasons understood as, right, as, as support for certain uh, positions. Reason is often also people talk about reason as a faculty, right, of human, like a few human faculty of reason. And that's often related. So the, re the faculty of reason is the faculty that presumably is able to appreciate reasons for and against, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of come to the conclusion, not conclusions not based on gut feelings, not based on, on whimsical decisions, uh, 
not based on oracles, but rather by means of the inspection of reasons, right? And then reasoning would be, right, reason and reasoning would be kind of that kind of, a, uh, right, the, 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 these mental, these, these uh, cognitive processes of uh, coming to conclusions by means of the examination of reasons. So I think that kind of, uh, but it, you know, in a way, it's a, it's kind of a terminological uh, thing. I don't think that reason is like a thing. It's not a natural kind, right? It's just really, and another factor that complicates things is uh, traditionally uh, there's this idea of the separation between reasons and emotions, mm -hmm. right? So reasoning and emotions, that's something you see already with Plato, right? With the metaphor of the two horses and then, uh, later, well, somebody like Descartes is also making the separation. And then, of course, now there's a lot of work already for decades, including by Antonio Damasio, right, Portuguese uh, cognitive scientist, yeah. who has been, people have been showing that, you know, it's it's all very much entangled, right? There's no separate, like, clear-cut separation between emotions and reasons. So in that sense, that's why I'm thinking, you know, I'm not, I don't even use this term reasons very often, I think, and also rationality, right? So there's also another related notion that people use a lot, and then there are all these different concepts of rationality going around. So, so this is, this is, yeah, this is very, uh, very complicated, very, you know, tangled with all kinds of notions. But at least as a first pass, I would say that, right? This idea of examining reasons and, you know, and uh, which is traditionally conceived as different from having, you know, letting emotions role, play a role in your decision-making processes. But even that has been very much revised as of recently. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but when it comes to reason or rationality, as some people call it, uh, it seems to me that many people out there, even nowadays, even cognitive scientists and people like that, have a sort of a flawed view of how, what rationality is supposedly because th there's still this idea that is very ancient in western tradition particularly that we have this sort of innate mental faculty that if we just apply it for and uh, I, I don't know exactly how but you would arrive at objective truth but it seems to me that when you're trying to understand how the world works, you have to acquire proper cognitive tools in each area of science, philosophy, right. etc. And this also, and it's also much more of a social thing than an individual. And I don't think that whatever rationality is or might be works well in individuals. I yeah, think. no, I mean, and of course, I, I completely agree with this, right? For all I've been saying from the beginning, right? Saying that I'm mm -hmm. a Vygotsky and that I, you know, I doubt, doubt very much this kind of social social conception of cognition, of human cognition. So in that sense, I, mean, I completely agree. And certainly I don't agree with the, the innateness claim, right? So as, as I've already mentioned as well, I think, you know, that, that like, of course, they're like the, what uh, Celia Hayes calls the starter kit, right? They're like some, dispositions that we have that are obviously genetically encoded, but they really need to be uh, trained for and activated, right, to, mm -hmm. to really develop in a particular way. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you. And of course, this puts a, 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 this, there's a methodological challenge then for cognitive science, because cognitive science is traditionally conceived as focusing primarily on the individual, right? Mm -hmm the individual cognizer as it was developed, right, so in the 20th century. But if you start talking, and that's also why many people then don't like this talk of like, you know, it's all social, because that they really have to like change methods quite substantially, right? So, and, and, and that makes it, you know, that kind of gives you a whole different conception of what, how to even study human cognition. But of course, there are many, many people, including Edwin Hudgens, who I already mentioned, Hutchins, who, who I've been thinking about cognition within cognitive science very much from this kind of social perspective as well. So it's not kind of, not, not at all like, there, there are other people I think who are sympathetic to the position that you were kind of describing. And I just wanted to say also about rationality. There's also like, there are many conceptions of rationality going around. So one would be, what is rational, right? What's the goal of like being rational is to have an accurate, truthful representation of the world. Mm -hmm. That would be one conception. Another conception that's like also known as ecological rationality. Yeah. The idea is like, you know, it's just that we're about surviving, navigating the world. And to some extent, 
like having an accurate representation of the world's going to play a role, but it's really not the goal, right? I mean, ultimately, you just want to be a, like a, a successful organism in your environment, and that's a different conception of rationality. Uh, yet a different conception of rationality is this kind of like um, economical conception of rationality, like in decision theory, right? Which is that you want to maximize your payoffs when you're when you're like engaging in, you know, interactions with people. And these are all the, the word rationality is used for all these different conceptions, and of course these are all very very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just before we talk about our last topic, I think that still about Mercier's and Sperber's argumentative theory of reasoning, uh, there's at least one point of disagreement that you have with them that I do not think you touched on yet. That is that has to do with the modular nature of yeah. reasoning because they come from a modularity of mind perspective in cognitive science that dates back to the 70s or 80s and i think you also disagree with that right? yes i do yes i do first because i don't i mean i think the modularity idea is very much something that fits this kind of this this uh, focus on uh, adaptation Mm -hmm. right? So because then, of course, you have these independent traits, and then if this trait is adaptive, then that one kind of will be present in the uh, offspring of the of a, in a given species, or or you know if it's not adaptive, it will disappear. Whereas I think that well, it's much, and I in fact already mentioned also the for example the role of emotions. And so it's a much more kind of untangled process that it's not you know there is no such thing as the faculty of reason that's like a separate thing from everything else that we do cognitively. Huh? And, and, and also in the way it's uh, supposed to develop, right? It develops by means like, you, you know, there's all this activation of all, all kinds of different cognitive capacities and capabilities that are activated for this uh, 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 ability to engage in argumentation and reasoning to emerge. So that's kind of the, the story there. I mean, I have a general, uh, let's say, skepticism towards modularity stories, generally speaking, right? So I'm already, at that level, I already kind of disagree, but also specifically with respect to reasoning and argumentation, I also think it kind of, uh, the, you know, it's not a thing in and of itself, right? It's just, that's what, in fact, what I said also at the beginning, it's not like in itself a natural kind, right? We can still, for kind of, theoretical purposes talk about okay here's the phenomenon we can kind of talk about it in a more or less circumscribed way but it's not a thing that's separated from all kinds of other uh, both uh, cognitive abilities and also all kinds of other ways in which we engage in linguistic uh, exchanges or all kinds of other exchanges mm -hmm. So for the last topic of this conversation, let's talk a little bit about everyone's favorite topic nowadays, that is fake news. And of course, we all know that everyone who disagrees with us are spreading fake news all the time, and they're the only ones. Yes, who yes, do that. Adult, yes, yes. Yeah, so what is fake news? So I, I, in my recent work, I hardly ever use the term fake news. Okay. I've been using the term disinformation. Mm -hmm. I prefer yeah. disinformation, and 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 for multiple reasons. So first, uh, so fake news has been weaponized, right? So that's exactly what Trump did, right? So you can, uh, it was introduced by a journalist originally, right? The term fake news to talk about, uh, you know, websites that pretended to be to be uh, journalistic uh, institutions and that weren't. And then, of course, it can be appropriated, and you can use it to, to, to anything that doesn't fit your 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 story, your narrative. You say, well, it's fake news, and and so in that sense, it's so it becomes like a, 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 a it's no longer a useful concept, right? Because it's been it's been appropriated and weaponized. Of course, disinformation is also a, a, it's also a normative notion. Of course, it also requires that you take a stance on what you consider reliable information and what's not reliable information. And there are many philosophers who have written on this. Don Fallis, for example, has a paper on what is disinformation. So it's not like, you know, by talking about disinformation instead of talking about fake news, it's not that like I'm, I'm escaping the, 
the normative dimension, right, of this discussion. But at least I think the term disinformation is more, I think it's kind of, uh, is less, it hasn't been weaponized in the same way, so it's more uh, fruitful for, for theoretical purposes. And then you ask me what it is, right? So, well, mm -hmm. what is, so the, the, the general take would be that, like, remember that I was talking about the beginning about uh, vi epistemic vigilance, mm -hmm. right? So this concept, so that you can think about uh, disinformation in terms of epistemic vigilance. So uh, Sperber and colleagues, they say, well, you know, you're, you can be, you can receive faulty information in at least two ways, either because the person herself is not well informed and passes on something to you, even though she herself thinks that it's accurate information. And in this case, people often talk about misinformation, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this distinction between. And then the other way is when people, like the person herself, the informant, knows that this information is not accurate and yet passes it on to you uh, to promote their interests, right? And that's usually people then use the term disinformation for that. Right? And of course, then the question then becomes what counts as accurate or inaccurate information? And so we still have this, this, uh, this, this issue and then that there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, it's going to be a perspectival thing. Well, I take that to be, and certainly during the pandemic, you saw, we saw this a lot because there was so much that we didn't know, right? And still there is so much that we didn't know about the, 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 the coronavirus that then like, you know, people would say something and then they say, look, this is this information and some of it was and some of it was, you know, uh, uh, also because we just didn't know. So in many cases, it's going to be very hard to even decide what counts as disinformation or not, mm -hmm. simply because there is no settled uh, consensus on what counts as accurate information on that particular matter. But assuming that there is, right, so for example, one thing, we can, I guess we can agree on is that the, the earth is round, right? Mm, I, I guess. Just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just rewatched this uh, very interesting documentary about flat earthers so called Behind the Curve. So, but th these people, right, so let's talk about the, 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 uh, the flat earthers. When they pr pr uh, promote their theories, they're engaging in misinformation because they themselves believe mm -hmm. in what they're promoting. Right. Whereas if you take a, a, a case, let's see a different case, um, right, let's say somebody, oh yeah, for example, somebody who is themselves not a flat earther, but right, so who thinks that the world is round, but has a business, right, of making merchandise for flat earthers. Okay, I'm, I'm using a toy example on purpose, right, because then it, so and then if this person then starts promoting uh, uh, it's a flat earth there, f arguments uh, to the effect that the, f the, the earth is flat, this person will be engaging in disinformation. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this dimension of uh, uh, whether yourself, you yourself, you know, you are, you are uh, what it is that you, which of course again makes it very complicated because then there's this requirement of intention, and there's a, there's a whole discussion of philosophy as well. What counts as lying? Do you have to like? And sometimes you can actually spread disinformation even when you are passing on accurate information, but it's disinformation because of the focus you give, right? That if you uh, promote too much of like you know phenomena that are statistically very rare, and don't talk about like for example, right? The anti-vaxxers who then pick that one case where somebody had a bad reaction to a vaccine and they, you know, that in, in and of itself might be true, but then they present it as uh, something that is representative of a much broader, statistically speaking, a much broader phenomenon that would count as, uh, that can also count as disinformation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if this, uh, there is like, there is no easy way to define what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand that. But is there something, uh, is this information a new phenomenon? I mean, and perhaps we could uh, interpret this question in two different ways. One of them would be just to simply uh, perhaps uh, think that it is a completely new phenomenon and we never saw it before in human history. Or, on the other hand, it is not completely new, but because of perhaps certain aspects of the current epistemic environment we live in nowadays, it is 
uh, importantly, uh, relevantly different from uh, anything else uh, exactly. rela related to it that we've experienced before? Yes, yeah, well, I lean more towards the second position, right? So mm -hmm. I think that uh, this information has always existed. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what has, it certainly has increased a lot with when we, we started having technologies of mass communication, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that really, uh, it's, I mean, you can just mislead that one individual, and then, of course, that happens all the time, but that's not going to be, you know, at this very large scale. So there's definitely the, the scale problem. But so one example that I, that, I, that I think is very telling is, you know, the witch hunts in the, mm -hmm. kind of in the 16th, 15th, 16th, 17th century and beyond. So apparently, uh, you could say that the cause for that was this one particular book that was written by this very, very kind of disturbed priest and, and, but it, as it so happened, when the, the, this particular person, I forgot his name, wrote the, the book, it was just after the invention of the press by Gutenberg in Europe. Mm -hmm. So this book could be printed, right? And because it could be printed, it spread much more. I right? saw so mm -hmm. all, the, 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 all the horrific stories on how women with certain characteristics are witches and all this. And of course, there's a very interesting gender angle to that, right? Because we, you know, so-called witches were women who didn't fit the particular mold of like of submissive women that uh, mm -hmm. so yes. they were feared. So then this book, the, the, this book spread in a way that if it had been written 50 years before, it would not have spread because there were, back then, you know, we were talking manuscripts and all of a sudden that could be, to some extent, mass production of right of, of the of the book, and it could be then disseminated. So you see how how like the different kinds of technologies, like new technologies for communication and dissemination of information, can fundamentally change right the the way uh, uh, like the phenomena of disinformation take place more broadly. So that's one example. And then of course you see. Later, you have, for example, in the 19th century with certain kinds of newspapers when they started being kind of massively circulated. And then you see, for example, with the invention of radio and then television, every time there's like a big technological breakthrough that has to do with communication and broadcasting, then new forms, new uh, ways in which people can be disinformed arise. Mm -hmm. And you see this in, for example, large scale propaganda campaigns uh, by by governments, right? So, for example, the uh, where well, you have Nazi propaganda is one of the most famous examples, but also Soviet propaganda. Uh, and then, of course, with the internet now, we are there's yet this new kind of technology that then opens up all kinds of possibilities, also possibilities for disinformation. So the way I see it, what's interesting is precisely as you were. Articulating what's interesting is to look at the way in which the like different kinds of technological developments uh, they they have different affordances right to use this term that's uh, you know at least in a, 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 a ecological psychology is, is very uh, widely used the affordances are different and then of course the way this information takes place uh, unfolds becomes different. So that's my take, and I it, and it still can be that there's something so fundamentally different, if nothing else, in terms of scale, that really needs to be looked at as such. But I don't think there has ever been like you know people talk about we're in the post-truth era and all this. I don't think we ever were in a truth era. Right? So there's it's always been it's the human condition that we're always kind of in a way. On the one hand, we depend epistemically from each other. On the other hand, you know, precisely for this reason, you know, we can be misled in many different ways. Yeah, about the post-truth era thing, I think that people are just because uh, nowadays uh, it's more easy than ever to spread information and disinformation. I guess that people are much more exposed to uh, disinformation, and so they tend to exaggerate. Uh, how ubiquitous yes. it is or how, how long it has existed for. Yeah, but I, I think it's, I mean, because on the one hand, you could also say that now we also are better equipped oh, to, yeah. right, 
because, for example, when you had, say, uh, 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 Nazi propaganda or Soviet propaganda, a lot of alternative sources of information were not even available, right? So books mm -hmm. were burned and, right, so there were all kinds of, like, censorship mechanisms so that people wouldn't even have access to certain kinds of information. Now, at least in places like Portugal or the Netherlands, etc., we do have access to information very widely, including uh, presumably reliable information. But the thing is, so on the one hand, you could say we're better equipped now mm -hmm. to not to be brainwashed by, by propaganda, as it were. On the other hand, precisely because of this overabundance of, abundance of signals that are being sent everywhere, it's much harder for for the individual kind of, you know, cognizer to see through, right, to sort out what is reliable information and what's not reliable information. So, so the, it kind of goes both ways in a way. Mm -hmm. So, look, uh, I, I'm also getting mindful of your time, so I think that this would probably a good, be a good point to end on and perhaps somewhere in the future we could uh, schedule another interview to talk about some of the other topics we've alluded to today, particularly in the philosophy of science and more specifically the epistemology of science and also things pertaining to race and gender, which sure, we've alluded sure, yes. to also and I think are very interesting. So uh, where can people find you and your work on the internet? So I have a website. Uh... But I don't really update it very often, to be very honest. Uh, but I think most of my papers are also on my university research website, and they are most of them are open access. Uh, so yeah, so you just if you, in principle, almost all of my work will be available open access somewhere if you Google or Google it around. I was until recently uh, a very uh, uh, frequent Twitter user. Now I've recently moved to Mastodon, so I don't know if you've been following this. Uh, so I, I, like, I would have said like uh, two months ago, I would have said if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, follow me on Twitter because I'm always kind of updating like things what I'm doing and my latest papers. But now you know I'm in this kind of transitional period. See if I'm gonna if the Mastodon thing is gonna stick. <laughs> so so yeah, I would say yeah that that would be like the way to kind of keep updated on what I'm doing. But yeah, I guess most of my papers are uh, available, uh, open access in one form or another. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Katerina, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. And I really love the conversation and, and I'm very much looking forward to having you on the show again somewhere in the future. Sure. Let's do that. Thank you very much for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider making a pledge on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perurga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klingby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gerbo, uh, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windiger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eiratam, Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, 
Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortés, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, and Morton Eichland, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Staffini, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.